Direct TV Stream brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before, so you can get all the entertainment you love without the hassle. And there's no annual contract. Get your TV together at directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. I'm Nick Amell, host of the Tennis Podcast, coming to you on this spooky October evening. I'm here joined by a sidekick host. Yeah, I'm Brandon. And you know that little boo probably really did scare someone who wasn't, who was like doing their laundry or driving to work. You might have just caused somebody to veer off the road. I take no responsibility for any veering off roads that may or may not happen during this podcast. Speaking of, this is a podcast where either myself or the sidekick host Brandon bring a top 10 list on any given topic on any given week with some research prepared ahead of time. The other person tries to guess without knowing what the list is. Brandon's going to do that here in a minute. But first, I have a few things to cover. Brandon, first of all, you're a couple pounds lighter in the organ department yeah. since we last recorded. How how you feeling? I'm feeling a lot better. If you've listened closely the last couple of weeks, maybe you could hear just in my demeanor that I was slowly dying inside. Uh, so they took my gallbladder out so that I'm no longer slowly dying inside. Well, you are still slowly dying inside, to be fair. We're all slowly dying inside, but I'm not dying quite as fast. So yeah, I'm feeling medium. I'm feeling pretty medium. So you're feeling medium today. You're one less gallbladder, but... Yeah, I'm feeling good. What you lack in gallbladder, you make up in, in booty cheeks. I would make up in a spooky list. And before you get to that spooky list, I don't know if you remember, but last time we recorded, we had to rush out of there real mm -hmm. quick because we both had a hard stop. So because of that, I didn't get to podcast reviews, and I'm going to start the show with those this week. Normally save this for the end of the show, but I read podcast reviews every week from our loyal slash compromised listeners. I don't know how loyal they are. They could be very fickle. They're so loyal. Prove it. You don't know what you're fucking talking about. Send us a picture of your tennis pod tattoo, and then I'll... <laughs> <laughs> now that... Once we get a tennis pod tattoo made it. sent to us, then, then we know we've made it, yeah. And we also know we've made it because of Black Apino J on Apple Podcasts says, I love how this podcast managed to distract me from the real world, especially in our current social climate. The camaraderie between Nick and Brandon feels so genuine... And it shows as their conversations goes on. My only regret is that I haven't added them to my playlist sooner. Don't sleep on this show! In all caps, because it's so good. Being able to help someone escape reality is maybe the highest compliment you can get. So thank you. Yeah, and we also fooled them in that, in that our camaraderie is genuine. Gotcha. The next one comes from Lyrics28 on Apple Podcasts. This podcast is great. It's entertaining and I always learn something, even when it's about a topic I wouldn't normally care about. Brandon and Nick have great chemistry and both are hilarious. Different concept for a podcast. Love it. I binged to get caught up and now that I am, I'm sad. <laughs> yeah. What are we doing here? We're making people sad, Brandon. I thought we were distracting them from reality. Well. It's all sad. Apparently we're, we're hitting a little bit of both. All right, so speaking of sad, why don't you sad us up with revealing your topic for this week's Spooktober episode? I don't think you're going to be sad at all. I think you're going to be excited because today we're talking about the 10 best Universal Classic Monster movies. Oh. As determined by the Internet Movie Database. Okay, okay. So why don't you refresh us what that means? The nerds on the Internet Movie Database, who I assume pay for some kind of membership to be able to comment and rank stuff, have you know given ratings they give ratings out of 10 stars to movies and all of the movies on this list have more than seven stars and they all star who we rec all recognize as the classic monsters the universal studios classic monster movies these are the movies that basically invented what our current american culture and maybe international culture views as like classic monsters the stars of Halloween. But the ranking we're doing is the top 10 movies themselves, so like individual titles, right? That's right. But they're starring the classic Universal Monsters, and it's voted by IMDb... Nerds. Nerds. Yes. 
I know what you mean by classic universal monster, mm -hmm. but is there like a strict definition on that? All these movies were made in the 1930s, 1940s. The exception of one was made as late as 1959. And they are all made by Universal Studios. Universal Studios, like, owned the market on monsters. I, in fact, I'm not aware of any classic monsters that did not come out of Universal Studios. Give me those, that year range again. Uh, the 1930s and 19, early 1940s. And then the last one was in 1959. Okay. So they're all black and white. I'm aware of, and we love both the black and the white. I'm aware of Look to the these monsters, but I don't think I'm going to get their titles just right. So well, I might most, have to guess the monsters and you tell me. For most of them, the title is also the name of the monster. So yeah, yeah that's okay. Okay. Uh, this is very Halloween specific, Brandon. Good job. I know. If you were sitting right here, I'd pat you right on the head. No lower than the neck. <laughs> I did not specify which head I was talking about. <laughs> Okay, so to, should I get started? Yeah. All right, so let me think in my head here. I got... Okay, I have one that I'm pretty sure has got to be in here, but not number one. Mm -hmm. And I'll say the Wolfman is somewhere in the four range. The Wolfman is number six on the list. I knew it. Now, this is a man who is also a wolf. A wolf, you say? Are you sure? As the title would indicate. This movie, The Wolfman, came out in 1941. The film stars Lon Chaney Jr. in the title role. Now, something you're going to notice over the course of this episode is a lot of the same names over and over because a lot of the same actors showed up in, playing multiple ro roles in different universal classic monster movies. And Lon Chaney Jr. I think played the Wolfman in four different Wolfman movies, including some where he interacted with other monsters. It's a small world because I, I know he's also a listener of the show. I think he wrote one of those reviews I read. Uh, this movie had kind of groundbreaking special effects uh, for the time, including a scene where he wolfs out on camera. You know, he's... <laughs> I'm laughing because I've seen this scene. In fact, my kids like to watch it on YouTube. Oh, yeah? You're talking about when he transitions from man to wolf, right? Right. He starts as a man with a clean shaven <laughs> face and then he... Those special effects are literally camera fades that... <laughs> Yeah. Well, this... sorry, I'm stealing your thunder. Go ahead. No, no, you're you've probably seen it more recently than I have. I'm just doing it from memory. But yeah, if your kids like that clip, then you're more familiar with it. And how compared to today's technology, it just looks pretty mundane. But listen to how difficult it was. Yeah. Okay. It was like torture for Lon Chaney. Let me quickly describe it to the listeners that haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. It's the guy sitting in a chair, and he's a normal looking man. And then, like, it'll be showing, it'll be a still shot in his face, and his face will, like, from one frame to the next have, like, over five frames, let's say, it becomes uh, a hairy wolf face. Mm -hmm. And we see now that they clearly filmed him in one spot, paused the camera, put the makeup on the hair, and then refilmed, and then faded the clips together. Like, it's so clear what's happening as a viewer now. But at the time, that was pretty groundbreaking, I guess. Between the transitions, does his head appear to move at all? Like very faintly. Okay. They took great care and great pains, I guess, to keep him still and make that look as smooth as possible. They made a plaster mold to hold his head absolutely still uh, while he got photographed, and they drew his outline on panes of glass in front of the camera. And then Lon Chaney Jr. went to a makeup man, Jack Pierce, and Pierce used grease paint a rubber snout, and a series of wigs and glued layers of yak hair to Lon Chaney's face. And then Chaney would come back to the set. They would line himself up perfectly using these panes of glasses of reference, and uh, they would shoot a few feet of film. And then he would go back to the makeup department, and they would stick more yak hair on his face. And then he'd go back to the film, and they did that about a half a dozen times. So you're right. It's about like five or six times there are five or six different transitions. And then this is called a lap dissolve. His character was named Talbot. Talbot's lap dissolve transformation on screen only took seconds. Yeah. While Cheney's took almost 10 hours. That's crazy. And it was an insanely long and uncomfortable day for what is now like laughable. But at the time, probably scared people senseless. 
It's funny to watch that now. I, I encourage you to watch it, by the way. I'll put the link to the YouTube clip in the show notes for this episode too, but it's probably 30 seconds in total, if not less. And it's just incredible to think now that that was scaring people to death back in the day, because now like even people who today are like deathly afraid of horror films could watch that and laugh. It's just funny how things have changed. But I love that old school practical effect mm-hmm. kind of mentality where they had to get so creative Like the panes of glass, like they had to get creative and resourceful to make what now is very simple effects. Well, I think it's just a different set of talents because you can still, I mean, I could use my computer to make a crappy effect that probably still looks better than back then. But, you know, I'm I'm not working on the Marvel Cinematic Universe with my Photoshop skills. No, you're not. I could have sworn I saw you there one day when I was working on it. Now in The Wolfman, he originally in one scene battled a bear which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the bear ran away during filming. I was going to ask, was it an actual bear? Sounds like it was. The bear was just like, fuck this, and took off. They're not paying me enough. I would love it more if it was a man in a bear suit, which is what I first assumed, Mm -hmm. and it still ran away as if it was a wild bear, and (laughs) no one ever saw it again. Started eating berries and mauled kid. (laughs) But yeah, so they only had a few scenes with the bear, and then they put them in the theatrical trailer. Which I'm sure pissed some people off at the time. They were like, holy shit, he's fighting a bear. And then they show up to the movie only to find that the bear ran away. And a lot of the modern myths about werewolves were originated from this film. Such as a person becoming a werewolf through a bite. uh, That the only way to kill a werewolf is with a silver bullet. And that werewolves and their victims are marked with pentagrams. Which I actually didn't know. I didn't know that one. That's awesome, but I didn't know that. We need more pentagrams in life, not less. Does it, so uh, let's get into some spoilers if you have them. Does someone kill this man with a silver bullet in the movie? No, he's never shot with a silver bullet. I won't say who, but someone beats him to death with a cane with a silver wolf's head on the tip. They use the silver. But it's sad because he's a normal man, like yeah, most after, of the time. After he's beaten to death, he transitions back to a man. Oh, well, that's fucking bullshit. If you kill him, you kill him. No, that's what always happens in those movies is that after he's killed, then he reverts back to his human form. And I think that's supposed to add like some sympathy, like, you know, he was just a man trapped inside this monster. No, I think it's, well, they didn't have the balls to do this back then, but now it's like there's the tragedy. Well, he's a good man, but he can't control the monster and it costs him his life. He doesn't get to go back, but. Uh, It used to be that a werewolf became a werewolf by being cursed or making a pact with the devil, which is fun, uh, that he could turn into a werewolf at any time, didn't matter if the moon, full moon was out or not. That was another thing. They invented the whole full moon thing in these movies. Also, original werewolves, OG werewolves, could be killed by any conventional means. Which makes more sense than the silver bullet. Because what are you going to do? You're going to shoot a bazooka at the wolfman, but sorry, there's no silver and it doesn't kill Well, him. in the monster squad, they put a stick of dynamite in the wolfman's waistband and push him out of a window and he explodes like 20 or 30 feet above an alley. And then all, and there's a part where his hand starts moving first and then like a foot starts moving and then all his bloody parts kind of come back together and then he stands up and howls. Oh, ow, ow. You're not far off. Also in the Monster Squad, he's played by the same guy who is Uncle Rico in Napoleon Dynamite. (laughs) Well, now I'm happy. I'm in a good mood now after hearing that. And my last note I'll share today about The Wolfman is this movie premiered two days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The studio was afraid that America wasn't in the, didn't have an appetite for horror, but apparently they did. They ate it up. Yeah. So remember Pearl Harbor. You know, they had to, to get like the news. Other, well, I mean, there's the newspaper, but if you wanted to watch the news, you had to go to the theater. Yeah, it might, that might have had something to do with it if they wanted to, to watch, you know, newsreels from the attack or newsreels on going to war. They probably crammed into like, yeah, f- fuck yeah, let's watch the news and let's watch the fucking Wolfman. I heard he's going to fight a bear. Let's watch these state-of-the-art special effects. Yeah. Okay, so The Wolfman is number six. Are there any other Wolfman movies? The Wolfman appears in, I think, 
two of these other movies, but they're not Wolfman movies. Okay. His name is not in the title. Uh, well, then I'm going to say number three mm-hmm. is the uh, is Dracula. Dracula is number four. I knew it. A surprising monster is higher than Dracula in number three, but Dracula is number four. The original Dracula, played by Bela Lugosi, is just fucking Dracula. That's all you need. Oh, it would have been great if, it was call, if they called it in 1931 fucking Dracula. Yeah. The director would have been put in jail if that happened in the 30s. Well, maybe not. This was a pre-code horror film. In the, I think, late 30s, maybe early 40s, this code was in force, basically like an early version of censoring for ratings, although it censored some things that were, you know, purely like political or cultural, like mm-hmm. censoring stuff that referred to like socialism or communism because we were, you know, it was during the Red Scare. Which is making a comeback. Or things that referenced sex or homosexuality, which some of which we will talk about later. But Dracula in 1939 was an American pre-code supernatural horror film that could have just as easily been called fucking Dracula. Mm -hmm. It is based on the 1924 stage play Dracula by Hamilton Dean and John Balderston, which in turn is adapted from the 1897 novel Dracula by Bram Stoker. So the Dracula film is actually based on the stage play, which is an adaptation of the novel. That's why when Francis Ford Coppola, Coppola came out with Bram Stoker's Dracula in the 90s, it was closer to the original story than 1931's Dracula. Well, you know, films in the 30s and before were really more just like plays, stage plays that were caught on camera. A lot of them were filmed that way. As I mentioned, the film stars Bela Lugosi as Count Dracula. He is sort of, when you think of the old black and white Count Dracula, he's, ex- he's the face that pops up into your mind. He's a vampire who emigrates from Transylvania to England and preys upon the blood of living victims, including a young man's fiance. Now, I mentioned this was a stage play first. Bela Lugosi had previously played the role of Dracula on Broadway. Oh, I didn't know it was the same actor. Okay. Yeah. Now, Bela Lugosi, he was Hungarian. Like, he was from Hungary, and he had a very thick Hungarian accent. So he really talked, you know, like fucking Dracula from the beginning. And he was also weird. He appears in multiple films that are on this list or sequels to films that were on this list. And the stories are consistent throughout that he was, he didn't really have much of a sense of humor and took himself very seriously. It's just like you. Actor David Manners, who played John Harker in the movie, recalled about the filming of Dracula. He said, I can see Lugosi parading up and down the stage, posing in front of a full-length mirror, throwing his cape over his shoulder and shouting, I am Dracula. (laughs) He was mysterious and never really said anything to the other members of the cast, except good morning when he arrived and good night when he left. He was polite, but always distant. Lugosi struck manners as a vain, eccentric performer. I never thought he was acting, but being the odd man he was. Did he have any other major roles outside of Dracula? Yes, he had a major role that is also in a film on this list. He sort of invented part of one of the the modern mythos around one of these monsters. Okay. He never once blinks his eyes in the film, which I got to give him credit for that. That does make him creepy. Same kind of thing that um, Anthony Hopkins did to make Hannibal Lecter more creepy. Dracula never once blinks his eyes. It's an effect that enhances the undead character's otherworldly aura. And it was helped by Bela Lugosi's famous menacing, creepy stare. I like those subtle things like that, where like most viewers would probably not even pick up on the, you know, I don't think I've seen him blink, but it's like, it unsettles the human mind subconsciously. Something in the back of your head registers that like this dude's not fucking right. Now, after viewing the initial cut of the film, Universal President Carl Lamle, I think, Carl reportedly said the film gave him the heebie-jeebies and ordered that it be re-edited. Director Todd Browning was bitterly disappointed by the studio's 11th hour re-edit and claimed that his best work ended up on the editing room floor. 
This happens all the time. You hear about the president, the heads of major studios making the fucking stupidest decisions that if you just took a poll of a random 10 people at Walmart, you would probably get a better decision made. And this is one of them. Like, he reportedly said the film gave him the heebie-jeebies. Like, Which is the point. Someone should have had the balls to tell him, yeah, that's the point. The more heebie-jeebies you got, the better job Todd Browning has done, and the more people will love this film and want to go see it. I agree with your general premise. However, I have to push back on the thought that asking 10 random people at Walmart would yield any positive results in any poll. <laughs> you just get a rash. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that the director said that his best stuff ended up on the editing room floor, mm -hmm. which struck me because that's, that was literal at the time. The cutting room floor was a real thing because yeah. editing was done by hand and the shit would end up literally on the floor. A mess on the so, floor. Yeah. All the best Dracula. Uh, it's just so different now, Brandon. Uh, now, this Dracula film originally had no soundtrack. Sound in movies was still so new in 1931 that producers were concerned they would confuse the audience. <sighs> Their concern was that if they w were watching Dracula creep across, you know, an empty castle toward a victim, and there was music playing, they'd be like, what the fuck? Is there a, an... <laughs> an an, a pipe organ in there in Dracula's castle? Does he have an orchestra you know, I didn't in there? Think of that. Yeah, that they wouldn't like understand the concept of background music. They would associate it with like a live band. But I think they would <laughs> because if you went to a silent film, didn't it have somebody up front playing ba 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 bum ba bum ba bum ba da 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 while you read the little black and white cards? Did you pull out an actual instrument there during that little thing yeah. because it sounded really good? So the film originally had no soundtrack, but Universal Studios hired composer Philip Glass to write a soundtrack in 1999, which was then added to all the DVD versions. So if you watch, oh. yeah, if you watch Dracula now, it has, I listened to it yesterday while I was working, and it is an awesome soundtrack. It is super creepy. It's a great Halloween uh, soundtrack for anybody out there, Dracula by Philip Glass. So yeah, if you watch the movie now, it has a really great soundtrack that it originally didn't have. Uh, prior to 1999, it was silent. Right. But I think there's, I mean, I'd have to watch both versions back to back to, to really judge. But off the top of my head, I can see the merits of a silent version. Maybe being, being kind scarier. Of, yeah, maybe so. Now, there is another Dracula movie in the top 10 that was made at the exact same time as the English version Dracula although it is not an English-language film. So, okay. guess that language. Uh, Hungarian. Are you fucking serious? How big do you think the well, Hungarian... Well, you said he was... You said he was fucking Hungarian. No, Spanish. Hollywood is making movies. That's in California. Okay. The next largest language market that they can get it out to is Spanish. Sure. So, at the same time that they made the English-language version of Dracula, literally, they would film the English version of Dracula during the day, and then they would film the Spanish language Dracula at night. Same cast, right? No, same, different same cast, everything. Different cast, same sets oh. used at night. Interesting. So yeah, number seven is Dracula, the Spanish language version. Number seven on the list. You get a freebie here. This was a common practice in this era of Universal Studios where they decided to film two versions of the movie at the same time. English version of the movie was filmed during the day. The sets would also be used at night to film a Spanish language version of the same story. That really shows you the type of film nerds voting on this list on IMDb. Because nobody... Nobody would have watched... None of our listeners have fucking watched the Spanish version of Dracula. Well, the one benefit that the Spanish version had was that they would come in and... The... More taquitos. <laughs> they would come in at the night and... <laughs> Taquitos sound really good right now. You just <laughs> fucking really threw me off. Uh, so the Spanish language was using the same script as the English version, uh, but it was directed by George Melford, and it starred Carlos Villarias as Conde Dracula. Mm -hmm. So Melford, the director, and his crew would come in at night and watch the dailies from the English version of the movie and just try to one-up that production with more interesting lighting and camera angles. So you're right, it's film lovers, film buffs believe that Melford succeeded in his goal of making a better version, and they claim that the Spanish version is better than the English version. But it wasn't seen very much. It was mostly only seen by film nerds. 
and for a long time it was forgotten, only mentioned briefly by some horror film historians in the 1960s and 70s. It finally got greater attention after a screening at the Museum of Modern Art in 1978, and that led to a popular home video release on VHS in 1992. Critical reception to this film often compared the two versions of Dracula, with some critics weighing on the pros and cons of both films based on the explicitness of the Spanish version with its costumes and scenes, the film's length, and the performance of Carlos Villarias as Conde Dracula. So yeah, they, it was all, they had an awesome setup. They would just come in at night and say like, well, whatever they did, we're going to do it better. And they made a better movie. So if they had to film at night, that means they'd have to manufacture daylight, right? For any day scenes? Yeah, it was probably more a case of the English version folks having to manufacture dark. I guess that's true. Yeah, you're right. Dracula, he can't come out in the sun. Fucks him up bad. <laughs> Does it now? Yeah. It fucks me up. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows, you're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friend's login for the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle, and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before. So you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part? There's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. That's directtv.com. Compatible device required. Content varies by package. Slow is just right if you're on vacation, a sloth, or describing QuickBooks. More like slow books. It sucks you in and slows you down with manual processes, integration difficulties, and glitchy delays that leave you scrambling for the numbers you need. Now is the time to make the switch to NetSuite by Oracle, the number one financial system. Because NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. It's everything you need to grow all in one place. With NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time, no matter how big your business grows. Failing to switch to NetSuite will leave you stuck trying to make sense of your books while your competitors sprint ahead. 93% of surveyed businesses increased visibility and control since switching to NetSuite. And right now, special financing is back. NetSuite is offering a -a one-of-a-kind financial program only for those ready to switch today. Head to netsuite.com slash bluewire right now. Get special financing at netsuite.com slash bluewire. One more time, netsuite.com slash bluewire. Okay, yeah, you've got three down so far. Dracula number four, Wolfman number six, and La Dracula at number seven. I'm trying to save a very specific one for number one, you can probably guess. Why don't I do number, I'm going to say number two or three is The Creature from the Black Lagoon. The Creature from the Black Lagoon is on the list, but it's number 10. No, that's not right. Sorry. It just slipped below the surface of this list. It's number 10. Still more than seven stars on Internet Movie Database. I lied earlier. I said it came out in 1959. I I misremembered. It came out in 1954. It's an American black and white 3D monster film. The film's plot follows a group of scientists who encounter a Piscine amphibious humanoid. Oh, baby. Which is a very scientific way of saying fish boy in the, <laughs> waters of, in the waters of the Amazon. The creature, also known as Gilman, was played by Ben Chapman on land and played by Roku Browning underwater. Of course. Yeah, he, you know, it, we got to get ourselves some underwater versions of us <laughs> as hosts of the show. Oh. Yeah, he was known as Gilman. They should have just called him the fucking creature. Gilman. Yeah, that's, that's, I've always hated that name. So Gilman is fully amphibious. He's capable of breathing both in and out of water. He possesses large webbed hands 
with sharp claws on the tip of each finger. The Gill Man's scaly skin is extremely tough. Hang on, are you talking about Gill Man or my first wife? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Am I right, fellas? Are you up in the Catskills in the 1950s? <laughs> His scaly skin is extremely tough, which combined with a fast-acting healing factor, it allows him to survive wounds that would be fatal to humans, such as gunshots and full immolation. So you can set him on fire and he'll bounce back from it. He also possesses superhuman strength, which is flamboyantly displayed in the second and third films. Flamboyantly? Yeah. That sounds what like... What the fuck does that even mean? I don't know. Like he's being kind of campy and gay about it? And he's being like... <laughs> Show off? Remember the... No, in Seinfeld, the super of the apartment that is like foreign and he's called yeah, Jerry a fancy, a fancy boy. fancy boy for wearing a fur that's, coat. That's Gil, man. Yeah. But with his strength. The costume made sitting impossible for Chapman, the actor who played him on land, for the 14 hours of the day that he wore it. 14 hours a day he was wearing this 1950s version of a special effects suit. Which the guys who play superheroes in movies now, like, they talk about how, you know, it's still brutal. Like, it's super hot in there. They'll sweat, like, pounds off their entire body. Imagine how much worse it was in 1954 when they're wearing, like, one-inch thick plain rubber. It has nothing breathable about it. There's no cooling suit. I said he overheated really easily. And due to those difficulties, he often stayed in the studio's back lot lake. <laughs> so he would go, like, amphibiaize himself and request to be hosed down frequently. Oh, this is the, the on-land guy, right? Yeah, the on-land guy was, was begging to get into the water. Which is ironic. Yeah, he also couldn't see very well while he was wearing the headpiece, and it caused him to scrape actress Julie Adams' head against the wall when he was carrying her into the grotto, presumably to make love to her. <laughs> Rick Browning is that stuntman who did the underwater shots of the creature, it said had to make an emergency bathroom visit while he was filming a scene. I'm going to assume that's diarrhea from drinking pond water. <laughs> now, to be clear, this is the amphibious version, right? Right. This is... So yeah. he's underwater all day. He's drinking pond water, probably thinking nothing of it. He's probably telling his friends, I got a sweet gig. I just get to swim all day. <laughs> he's getting amoebas in his brain. Imagine that, like, visualize the costume, the creature of the Black Lagoon. Imagine that guy running from the water to the bathroom like way offset holding his ass i like it well take that image and keep it in mind but just know that he'd been underwater for several minutes like he had to hold his breath for a long time and then he was like fuck this i can't do it anymore and he popped out of the water in full costume next to an unsuspecting mother and her young daughter on the nearby oh, shore no. <laughs> he said they fled in terror once they saw him he said, they took off, and that's the last I saw of them. Well, that would be scary if you didn't have context for what the fuck you were seeing. You'd think a fucking... He comes yeah. out waddling out of the water, water and holding his butt. <laughs> well, and you don't know that he's in... Like, you think you've been invaded by another species. <laughs> that ran straight to an outhouse. Because they were just passersby, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is the first film that Stephen King says he can remember watching probably had a big impact that's why i think this film is low for 10 well like i can't speak to the quality of like the film as a whole but from like an iconic standpoint i don't know i think more people reference i guess not more than dracula so maybe number five no you're I don't know. you have a good point there's scenes uh, that are filmed underwater from like the creature's perspective looking up at the female actress swimming and i see that all the time and some of those <laughs> I see a lot of you have those on Pornhub now. <laughs> Several of those scenes were mimicked in the opening scene of Jaws. Oh, yeah. You're right. Which has then been mimicked many times since then. So, you know, you're not wrong. And they use it a lot in the HBO docuseries. Um, what's it called? The one with the Golden State Killer. Uh, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. Is that what it's called? Anyway. They've got one they from Underwater? They routinely go back to that clip of the creature from the Black Lagoon. Oh, like, right. As a transitionary piece. Uh, I don't remember why, but it's, oh, because it's throughout she, that she series. Oh, because she had watched it or something, yeah. Yeah. The last note about this, so I, I mentioned it was a 3D movie. When the creature attacks the character Z, 
The script called for the creature to pick him up and throw him into the camera for a 3D effect. Unfortunately, the wires used to lift Z up to make it appear as though he was actually being picked up by the creature kept breaking, which is a a constant theme in these movies about stuntmen getting hurt, doing really dangerous, stupid stuff. After two tries, Jack Arnold, the director, just said, fuck it, just have him get strangled. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like I've been in that situation. I've definitely said that to someone before, too. Fuck it, just strangle him. Yeah. Yeah. Just choke him out. Me and Tony Soprano, right? Yeah. So that's the only movie on this list that features the creature from the Black Lagoon. Okay. So, The Mummy. The Mummy? Where would you guess The Mummy falls on here? I would have put its ass at 10, but... Well, then you're not far off. Since 10's taken, yeah, I'll say 9. Yeah, it is number 9. The Mummy is number 9. I am with you. I think the entire concept of The Mummy is lame. Yep, I do too. And there's no Brendan Fraser in it. Not in this one. Yeah, in this one, which was made before Brandon Fraser was even a twinkle in Old Man Fraser's balls. Mm. This came out in 1932. It's another American pre-code horror film. It stars Boris Karloff. Oh, yeah. King of uh, of Universal Classic Monster Movies. Boris Karloff, Zeta Johan, David Manners. David Manners, you may remember, also played... John Harker in Dracula. He's the one that said that uh, Bela mm-hmm. Lugosi was such a fucking weirdo. In this film, an ancient Egyptian mummy named Imhotep is discovered by a team of archaeologists and inadvertently brought back to life through a magic scroll. I hate it when I do that. He's disguised himself later as a modern Egyptian named Ardith Bey. And Imhotep searches for his lost love who he believes has been reincarnated into a modern girl. Girl? Don't they mean lady or woman? I've, evidently, it was uh, a 12-year-old girl. Not really. So, I'm picturing the mummy as Boris Car- it, it really has the look of like a guy wrapped in toilet paper, right? At first. You know, honestly, the makeup for the mummy in this was really good. In fact, there is some weirdness where... So, for most of the movie, when you see Boris Karloff, he's playing the Ardith Bay version. He still looks very creepy. He has a sunken face, super dark eyes, but he doesn't look like the traditional mummy. In fact, there's only one scene where he needed to be like made up as a mummy. Yeah, wrapped up like a mummy. And it's just like when he opened his eyes. He didn't have to move his mouth or talk or anything. But he insisted on being there and being in full makeup. I'm looking at pictures, and you're right, the makeup's pretty good. And as a reminder, again, I'll put links to photos and videos and shit to help you, the listener, visualize what we're talking about in the show notes of this episode. Like you said, he wasn't in that awesome-looking, creepy mummy stuff most of the time. But even when the mummy makeup is good, the mummy himself doesn't look like he can do... He would definitely scare the shit out of you. But he doesn't move fast. No. It looks like if you hit him with a baseball bat, he would fall apart. Yeah. But does he blink, Brandon? He can only be killed by a silver baseball bat. (laughs) The movie was inspired by the, you know, real-life opening of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. Tooting what? I mean, if you got a better way to say this King Tut's name, should have just said King Tut. How about just King Tut? But yeah, it's... I think it's Tutankhamun. When I was a kid, I, I, in my head, I pronounced it Tutankhamun. And then I watched, <laughs> you know, a documentary or something. Tutankhamun. I think that is better than whatever tooting you're talking about. Uh, so they opened that up in 1922. And then also... Um, is that it? Hang on. Sorry. They opened that in 1922? Mm-hmm. God, I forgot that. Kind of recent. I forgot how recent that is. And yeah. it's less, what, about 10 years or less that they made this movie? So yeah, well, interesting. that's part of it. The Unlike Dracula and another one of our uh, monsters we'll talk about that were inspired by classic novels, this film had no basis for like an Egyptian, there was no basis for an Egyptian themed horror film. So uh, producer Carl, can't pronounce his last name again, commissioned a story editor to find, find something to uh, write a basis for an Egyptian-themed horror film. He wanted something with a mummy in it. So this guy Shaver and a writer named Nina Wilcox Putnam 
learned about this character named Alessandro Cagliostro, and they wrote a nine-page treatment entitled Cagliostro, and the story was set in San Francisco. It was about a 3,000-year-old magician who survives by injecting nitrates. Yeah, you haven't done that? Yeah, which is the shit that they put into, like, fertilizer and explosives. And the fucking COVID-19 vaccine, am I right? Right. So, uh, Universal Studios' Carl was pleased with the concept, and he hired writer John Balderston to write a script. Balderston had written for Dracula and another monster we haven't covered yet. And he had also actually covered the opening of King Tut's tomb for the New York World News when he was a journalist. So he was very familiar with the tomb being unearthed. Uh, He moved the story to Egypt and he renamed the film and its title character to Imhotep after a real historical architect. You mentioned not a great movie. You're right. Did not get great reviews at the time. A reviewer for the New York Times said, unimpressed, for the purposes of terror, there are two scenes in The Mummy that are weird enough in all conscience. In the first, The Mummy comes alive and a young archaeologist, going quite mad, laughs in a way that raises the hair on the scalp. In the second, Imhotep is embalmed alive in that moment when the tape is drawn across his mouth and nose leaving only his wild eyes staring out of the coffin, is one of decided horror. But most of Mm. The Mummy is costume melodrama for the children. That last sentence really took a turd all over it. Yeah, that last sentence says all you need to know. He said it's baby shit. (laughs) (laughs) I like Boris Karloff in general, and the pictures I'm looking at are pretty good, but don't know if I'm going to make it a priority to watch this film anytime soon. The year before this, movie was made, Boris Karloff was unknown. Uh, And then he appeared, uh, as I'm sure we'll cover in a moment or two, as the title character in one of the most famous monster films of all time. Yep. The next year, when The Mummy came out, he was billed only at, they only had to advertise this film as Karloff dot 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 The Mummy. That was all it took. Which is a shame because Boris is such a great name. It is. that Boris Karloff is a good horror name. Yeah. So one last thing interesting about tied to this movie, the film's director, Carl Frund, was better known as a cinematographer. About 20 years after directing this, Frund was hired by Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz to be the director of photography on their classic sitcom, I Love Lucy. It was Frund who pioneered the technique of filming the series with multiple cameras in front of a live audience, a concept which made the notion of reruns possible. Prior to that time, almost all TV programs were broadcast live and had to be performed twice, once for the Eastern time zone and again three hours later for the Pacific time zone. God. So you're saying that around this time, if there was a show on TV, they performed it it twice in the night. Yeah. Huh. I think they used to even do that with Saturday Night Live in the first few seasons. I think they might have performed it once for the East Coast and once for the West Coast because there was stuff that would get cut out before the West Coast performance. I could be wrong about that, but with, I mean, that's pretty huge. This guy pioneered something that invented reruns. I'm sure it would have come about either way, but. Yeah, it was inevitable, but. Like it or not, reruns are a huge part of American culture and probably just culture around the world. If it wasn't for reruns, I never would have discovered Seinfeld. There you go. And it has shaped my life ever since. So that's The Mummy. The Mummy at number nine. Okay. Well, I definitely am quite confident in what number one is, but I'm trying, Mm -hmm. and I'll guess it here in a second. Well, let me give you a a hint here. There are one, two, three, four movies remaining on this list out of five that mention the same monster. So once you say that monster's name, we're going to talk about several movies. All right, let's do it then. It's Frankenstein's monster. One of the Frankenstein's movies, number one, for sure. Right. So we'll talk about the original movie, Frankenstein, first. Frankenstein is number two on the list. Hmm. Frankenstein is a 1931 American pre-code science fiction horror film directed by James Whale and adapted from a 1927 play by Peggy Webling which in turn, like, Drac- uh, like Dracula, which was based on a novel, Mary Shelley's 1818 novel, Frankenstein, or The Modern Prometheus. Yep. Frankenstein 
stars Colin Clive as Henry Frankenstein, an obsessed scientist who digs up corpses with his assistant in order to assemble a living being from body parts. Now, his assistant, That is such a great premise, by the way. I love that. His assistant in this movie is often referred to as Igor, but in this movie, his assistant was named Fritz and didn't quite have the same personality that we've come to associate with Igor. We'll get to Igor later. So in our relationship, I'm Henry Frankenstein or Victor Frankenstein, and you are Igor. Fritz. I'm Fritz. And the podcast we're recording right now would be the monster. Mm Mm-hmm. So yeah, they dig up corpses and they assemble a living being from the body parts. And then the creature, often known as Frankenstein's monster, or I think we all just have to accept now, it's also just referred to as Frankenstein. I will try to differentiate, but it's tough. Uh, is portrayed by Boris Karloff. They really should have named him. Well, in the novel, his name was Adam. Yeah, that's right. I wonder why. Yeah, in fact, I, I think in the movie, they might have ma- mentioned his name as Adam once. I'm not sure. This film was a commercial success upon release, is generally well-received by critics and audiences. It spawned a number of sequels and spin-offs, and has had a significant impact on popular culture, with the imagery of a maniacal mad scientist, a subservient hutchback assistant, often referred to as Igor, as well as the film's depiction of Frankenstein's monster, all have become iconic. In 1991, the U.S. Library of Congress selected Frankenstein for preservation in the National Film Registry. Now, in Mary Shelley's original work, 1818 is how long that novel came out. Yeah, I, yeah. I, for some reason, I thought it was 1880s or 1890s. And this is, don't let it be lost on you that this is 1818, a woman writing a very um, probably controversial novel at the time, bringing a man back to life, naming him after Adam in the Bible. And she was uh, 19 when she wrote it. Yeah, fuck, Jesus, I forgot that. And as an example or illustration of how influential she and this book are, she, I remember she was one of the top 10 most influential women in our our episode that we did on, on influential women, so... Is a big deal. Now, in her novel, they didn't use electricity to bring the creature to life. Instead, Henry, well, in her novel, his name was uh, Victor Frankenstein. Yeah. Anyway, Frankenstein discovers a previously unknown but elemental principle of life and develops a method to imbue vitality in, in, into inanimate matter. And the exact nature of that process is left largely ambiguous. And for a 19-year-old woman in 1818 to even have, like, the knowledge base to work with, the, with, work with that premise at all. It's pretty, and, yeah, she's pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's impressive. Oh, here was the answer to whether or not they call him Adam in the film or not. Part of Frankenstein's rejection of his creation is the fact that he does not give him a name. Instead, Frankenstein's creation is referred to by words such as wretch, monster, creature, Demon, devil, fiend, and it. It. When Frankenstein talks to the creature, he addresses him as vile insect, abhorred monster, fiend, wretched devil, and abhorred devil. You know what I'd say? You can't talk to your kids like that. Well, I'd say, motherfucker, you made me. Yeah. I didn't ask to be here. If you talk to him like a monster, he's going to act like one. Mm Mm-hmm. It's all on him. So there's a scene, you know, it's one of the uh, more famous scene where Frankenstein is walking around. See, for, sorry, the creature, the monster, the wretch is walking around and he sees a little girl throwing flowers in the lake. And then he walks over and picks her up and throws her in too. Oh, he does? Which is actually kind of funny. Uh, but the seven-year-old actress named Marilyn Harris played Maria, uh, who had gets thrown into the lake. And she had done several takes, and none of them turned out quite right. She was wet and tired and fucking seven years old, and she agreed to do one last take of the scene. And it's the one that appears in the finished film. This is after the director promised her anything she wanted if she would do that last take. She asked for a dozen hard-boiled eggs, her favorite snack. What the fuck? (laughs) First of all, you're seven. Ask for some goddamn candy or ice cream. Yeah, they had candy in 1931. Yeah, of course they did. Uh, Or ask for a puppy or a pony or uh, a dolly. 
but a, a dozen, dozen hard-boiled <laughs> eggs, her what? favorite snack. Okay, even if it's your favorite snack, your ass doesn't need a dozen of them, girl. And also just wait till you get home. I'm sure your mom or dad will make you a, a, a hard-boiled egg. This girl... It's not, a, it's not a rare commodity. This girl probably blew ass like a fucking oh sulfur hell. But <laughs> it was so easy to accommodate her stupid seven-year-old request that the director gave her two dozen hard-boiled eggs. Oh, no. Did she eat them all right there? I hope so. I hope she just started sucking them down like, like still wet from the lake water. It probably doesn't say, but she ended up dying from this. In the DVD uh, commentary for the film, they suggest that she actually wasn't a good swimmer. And they quoted her saying that she had only had a couple swimming lessons before filming and never dived underwater before. It seems like criteria for hiring this girl should be must know how to swim. It sounded like she had a really uh, like fucked up Hollywood child actor mom who was like, fuck, no, tell him, you know, you can, she can swim. She can swim. She's fine. She's known how to swim a long time. She dives like a little penguin. You're going to be so mm -hmm. impressed. She's like, shut the fuck up. Just go out there and get in the water. And then she's like, mommy, they want to give me anything I want. She's like, mmm, get a dozen hard-boiled eggs. <laughs> she won't make her daughter a hard-boiled egg at home. So the daughter has to wait till she's in a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to have a film director ask her what she wants to get her hard-boiled egg. So there are some sequels to Frank. No, hang on. What would you ask for, Brandon, if you were her at seven? Uh, at seven, I would ask for something with Ninja Turtles, probably. Fucking nerd. It's Nick here, inviting you to join our Tennis Pod Army of Misfit Toys by adorning yourself in our official Tennis Podcast merchandise. Go to tennispod.com slash merch now for our newest designs, including Peanut Butter is the New Water, the Tennis Pod Retro Logo, Brandon's Body Elves, Dr. Phil, and much more. In fact, if you don't go check out this new merch, then just go ahead and unsubscribe. Shirt! Yes, a shirt saying that is available too. All designs are available in multiple shirt colors, sized for both men and women. We also have mugs and stickers too. So what are you waiting for? A licking machine shirt? Well, we have that too. So get your ass over to tennispod.com slash merch now. That's one zero I-S-H-P-O-D dot com slash M-E-R-C-H. Branding! Like I was saying, there are several sequels to Frankenstein. Which one is the most famous sequel to Frankenstein that also introduced... Bride right? of Frankenstein. Bride of Frankenstein is number one on the list. This is okay. the most well-reviewed, most superior film on the list, according to the IMDb nerds. The Bride of Frankenstein is a 1935 American science horror fiction film. It's the first sequel to Universal Pictures' 1931 Frankenstein. As with the first film, Bride of Frankenstein was also directed by James Whale and stars Boris Karloff as the monster. The sequel features Elsa Lanchester in the dual role of Mary Shelley and the titular character at the end of the film. It takes place immediately after the events of the original Frankenstein and it's rooted in a subplot of the original Mary Shelley novel where the plot follows a chastened Henry Frankenstein as he attempts to abandon his plan to create life only to be tempted and finally coerced by his old mentor, Dr. Pretorius, along with threats from the monster into constructing a mate for the monster. Oh, baby. Since the film's release, its reputation has grown. It's now frequently considered one of the best sequels ever made. Many fans and critics consider it to be an improvement on the original, in 1998, it was selected by the Library of Congress for preservation in the U.S. National Film Registry, having been deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. I believe it was on our list of top 10 uh, horror movie sequels as well. Yeah. Might have been number one. Now, at the end of this movie, this is a spoiler, the monster kills himself and uh, the bride, he he knows that they should not be things. At the end of this movie, the monster who's been on a fucking killing rampage to the whole movie, he kills this guy named Carl on the rooftop and he comes down the steps and he sees his mate, the bride. Mm -hmm. And he's all excited and he reaches out to her and asks, friend? 
And then she just screams at him. This like blood curdling. Uh-huh. And the monster is dejected. And he says, she hate me like others. <laughs> well, and then he just starts fucking up the laboratory. Henry Frankenstein and his fiance like, you know, pull off to the side and the monster's just rampaging and fucking everything up. And then Dr. Pretorius runs in and he says the monster's actions are about to destroy them all. And the monster pauses and he tells Henry and Elizabeth, go, you live, go. And then to Dr. Pretorius and the bride, he says, you stay, we belong dead. Oh. While Henry and Elizabeth flee, the monster looks at the bride, sheds a tear, and then pulls a lever to trigger the licking machine. (laughs) (laughs) Now, he pulls a lever and it triggers the whole laboratory and tower to come down in in destruction, which I would argue Frankenstein should not have installed that lever. (laughs) That was my first question. Why is there a lever for that? Sounds like some Dexter's Lab shit. A self-destruct lever. Also, just for today, for only this episode, I will temporarily promote you to co-host because of the licking machine joke. Hell yeah. Like I said, this was a pre-code film. So they were able to sort of sneak in some uh, themes and topics that later they probably couldn't get away with. Gay film historian Vito Russo is talking about Dr. Pretorius. Stop short of identifying the character as gay, instead referring to him, which I guess is the code for the time, as sissified, Mm -hmm. a sissy itself being Hollywood code for homosexual. Dr. Pretorius serves as a gay Mephistopheles, (laughs) which is fun. What? A gay devil. Okay, okay. A figure of seduction and temptation, going as far as to pull Frankenstein away from his bride on their wedding night, to engage in the un, uh, unnatural act of creating non-productive life. Which I think is a little bit of a stretch, but maybe they got a point. That's a stretch. A novelization of the film published in England made the implication clear, having Pretorius say to Frankenstein, Be fruitful and multiply. Let us obey the biblical injunction. You, of course, have the choice of natural means, but as for me, I am afraid that there is no course open to me but the scientific way. Which again, like... Meaning he has... Uh, that could just as easily mean that he was asexual and could only procreate the scientific way. Or that he had a um, deficiency that he... Oh, like he was impotent. Yeah, and yeah, maybe. impotent. So, or maybe, he, uh, I guess maybe he was gay. Uh, cinematographer John Miskal presented a problem on the set with his drinking. It was so serious, the studio had to provide a car to get him safely to and from the set. Nevertheless, he was very good at his job, even when drunk, and James Whale liked that he worked fast and rarely wasted time fussing with incidental camera and lighting hardware. But That's one of those rare instances where the, your boss is like, no, he's better drunk. Yeah, but I like how they did everything they could for him other than help him with his alcoholism. <laughs> yeah, they did a really good job enabling him. So the bride of Frankenstein is supposedly the most obscure of the Universal Studios classic monsters, Uh, although I guess you can make an argument for that. Anyway, she's on screen for less than five minutes, and she's the only classic monster never to have killed anyone. Hmm. Although it could be argued, and this was probably written by a man, it could be argued that her rejection drove the monster to suicide. Now, why does she reject him? Because he's hideous? Yeah, because, the, well, I mean, if you look at the two of them, they clearly did a lot better job on the bride. She looks like... She looks like a normal person with just weird hair. She looks like, like yeah, she looks like an attractive Hollywood actress with fucking crazy hair, and he looks like hammered shit. Yes, uh, but still, you'd think that, I don't know, she's dead, he's dead, let's be dead together, but I guess not. All right, we got a couple other Frankensteins to talk about here. All right. Take a guess and expand the Frankenstein family. Well, there's the son of Frankenstein. There you go. Son of Frankenstein is number eight on the list. And it is not a result of Frankenstein's monster and the bride making love and making a baby, which I would love that movie if it came out now. The the monster and the bride actually do procreate and she is pregnant for nine months Mm -hmm. and then gives birth to a little dead, undead baby. 
I think we need a family road trip comedy movie with the Frankenstein monster family. I think they called that the Munsters. By the way, maybe we've talked about this before, but Bride of Frankenstein and Son of Frankenstein mm-hmm. imply that these are Bride and Son of the Doctor and not the monster. Right. So and that, I have a problem with that. That's exactly what Son of Frankenstein is about. It's a 1939 American horror film. The film is the third in the Universal Pictures E. Frankenstein series. It's the follow-up to Bride of Frankenstein. Son of Frankenstein stars Basil Rathbone as Baron Wolf von Frankenstein, Mm -hmm. who, with his wife Elsa, played by Josephine Hutchinson, and son Peter, played by Donnie Dunnigan, return to his late father's estate. So, yeah, Baron Wolf von Frankenstein is the son of Henry Frankenstein. Did you say the the actor's name was Donnie Dumb again? Donnie Dunnigan. Okay. Near the castle lives Igor, played by Bella Lugosi. See, he popped up again. He yeah. created what, who we now recognize as like, you know, the prototypical Igor. Uh, a crazed shepherd whose neck was broken in an unsuccessful hanging attempt. So it wasn't a hunchback. He tried to kill himself. Uh, <laughs> if he didn't do it right. And now for the rest of his life, every time he tries to turn and look at someone, they look at him and say, like, there's something else he fucking can't do. <laughs> oh, my God, Brandon. <laughs> well, it, it gives new, uh, it sheds new light on the animated kids version of the Igor that came out a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. Among the castle's remains, Frankenstein discovers the remains of the monster, again played by Boris Karloff and decides to try to save his family name by resurrecting the creature to prove his father was correct. He finds, however, the monster only responds to Igor's commands. And clearly, Igor uh, is someone who should be in command. Yeah. This is the first movie where uh, Boris Karloff started to voice concerns about how the creature's character might develop. He was worried that the character would be reduced to a comic strip one-dimensional killing machine. Uh, and then to a certain extent, that did start to occur in The Son of Frankenstein. Is there another Frankenstein in the top 10? There's one more Frankenstein in the top 10. It is number five on the list. This is the one I thought would be the hardest for you to guess. It's where a comedy duo meet Frankenstein. I can't, I don't know. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. It's number five. This is the I part didn't where you know tell about me, this. This is the part where you tell me you don't know who Abbott and Costello are. I definitely know who they are. They are... You fucker, you're Googling. No, I'm not. I'm just... uh, Recalling? I'm just recalling. They are a comedy duo composed of comedians Bud Abbott and Lou Costello, whose work with radio, film, and television made them the most popular comedy team of the 1940s and early 1950s. You idiot. I knew who they were. I recognized the names, but I... Abbott and Costello... Couldn't have put their faces to it. Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein is a 1948 American horror comedy film directed by Charles Barton, starring the comedy team of Abbott and Costello. This is the first of several films in which the comedy duo meet classic characters from Universal's horror film stable. In this film, they encounter Count Dracula, played by Bella Lugosi, Frankenstein's monster, this time played by Glenn Strange, and the Wolfman. I was going to ask about that. Okay, sorry. No, uh... Boris is not signing off on this shit. By this time, Boris Karloff was like, I don't, he was done wearing the costume. I think it was really uncomfortable. And The Wolfman, again played by Lon Chaney Jr. This film is considered the swan song for the big three universal horror monsters, none of whom had appeared in a universal film since The House of Dracula in 1945. So they kind of made a comeback with this movie. Uh, and then, you know, they were sort of undead again and more crappy hammer film remakes and reboots through the 60s and 70s. Ab and Costello play baggage clerks at a railway station in Florida in this movie. And then the wolfman in human form calls them and tries to warn them about a shipment arriving for McDougal's House of Horrors. Uh, But he wolfs out before he can finish the phone call and they think it's a prank. The crates arrive, Abbott and Costello deliver them, open them, and then horror comedy ensues. Now, I haven't seen the movie, so maybe I'd love it, but from the outside looking in, how do you feel about Universal, like, intentionally turning their horror icons into comedy figures? Well, one, they were just trying to make some money and trying to keep things going, but no, I think that's fine. Like, 
I don't know. When a sequel or something comes out that you don't like, it doesn't necessarily erase what you was good and you appreciated about the original. Uh, some people get upset. Like the Star Wars prequels and sequels. I don't think any of the sequels are very good, but that doesn't like ruin anything for me. Look, I'm not upset about it, but I'm just saying if I was running things, I probably wouldn't do it. But that's me. Well, that's why we're not the president. It just of... feels like selling them out a little bit. But I get that, you know, it's, it's not about artistic integrity. It's about, the, it's about the mighty dollar. So, you know, you're not wrong in your opinion. Uh, Lou Costello didn't want to make the movie. He declared, no way I'll do that crap. My little girl could write something better than this. Wow. And a $50,000 advance in salary changed his mind. Also, the signing of director Charles Barton, uh, his team's good friend, and the man who had made some of their best films. Yeah, a little a chunk of change changed uh, Lou Costello's mind. I wonder if his, if his little girl he mentioned was the same girl that ate two dozen hard-boiled eggs in one sitting. <laughs> a little girl is a genius. In the year 2000, American Film Institute placed this film on its 100 years, 100 laughs list, and it ranked number 56. I've never seen it. I don't know how the laughs hold up now. Yeah, I haven't seen Universal it. Universal Studios initially did not try to cast Bela Lugosi as Dracula because they thought he was dead, which actually would have made him a stronger candidate. Wait, I don't understand. They thought the character was dead? No, they thought oh, the Bela actor? Lugosi was dead. Oh, God. But he was alive and ready for work. And they got him, right? Yeah. He was ready for some work. He had blinked in years. Okay, that's all I got on Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. While I was looking up this movie on Wikipedia, I accidentally came across a few other monsters that I had not thought of before. Mm -hmm. There's Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde. Not on this list. Okay. There's The Invisible Man. The Invisible Man is number three on the list. Evidently, it's a good movie. I, didn't, I haven't seen the original Invisible Man. I did see the 2020, uh, I think, remake yeah. with Elizabeth Moss. That one was good. And yeah, it was good. The Invisible Man, the original, is a 1933 American science fiction horror film based on H.G. Wells' 1897 The Invisible Man. The film involves uh, Dr. Jack Griffin, played by uh, Claude Rains, who is covered in bandages and has his eyes obscured by dark glasses. And the result of a secret experiment that makes him invisible. He never leaves his quarters, and this strange man demands that the staff leave him completely alone, uh, but then his landlady discovers that he is invisible, which is just like a noisy landlady to do. I think this man might be invisible. Comes snooping around like a female Mr. Furley. Oh, yeah. So then Griffin returns to the laboratory of his mentor, Dr. Cranley, and he reveals his secret to Dr. Kemp and his former fiance, Flora Cranley. Hmm. So they learn that uh, Griffin, the Invisible Man's discovery, is also driving him insane, and it's leading him to try to prove his superiority over other people by performing harmless pranks at first and eventually turning into murder. So I kind of wondered, like, is the Invisible Man really a monster? No. Well, I've got a good argument to make that he is. There's two strong points I'm about to make here. Well, first is his total body count. There's four murders that are depicted directly on screen, 18 search party members that are killed off screen. Wow. And then he derails a train, which results in 100 deaths. So in total, the invisible man, Dr. Griffin, kills 122 people before he is killed making him the most bloodthirsty villain of the old Universal Pictures horror films. Well, that might make him a monster in the, in the way the word is thrown about now. Like, about, well, like you could call a serial killer a monster. Let me make but... one more point. Okay. Most of the time we see him on screen, we can see what, who he is and what, where he is and what he's doing because he's wrapped himself in bandages and glasses and a coat and a hat and shit. But when he commits murder, he has to take all that off. And he's nude. Oh. So every time he murders four people directly on screen, murdered 18 search party members off screen, and then derailed a train, he did all this shit buck-ass naked. All right, you're right. Monster. 
he's a monster. What if the invisibility wore off right in the middle of him strangling someone? That would be terrifying. Do you think him strangling you naked is more or less terrifying than him strangling you while invisible? I'd rather not see. I'd rather just be invisible. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. When the DVD edition of this movie was released, for some reason in the subtitles, they changed a word of dialogue in the scene where Dr. Griffin exposes his, <laughs> exposes, exposes his invisibility to the villagers. In the subtitles, he boasts that invisible man can rob and rape and kill. Uh, but it's clear on the soundtrack that he doesn't say rape, he says wreck. So they took where he says rob and wreck and kill, and they were like, you know, rape really makes a lot more sense here. <laughs> so they added rape after the fact. I think it's the case of the subtitle guy just hearing what he wanted to. Yeah. He's like, I know what I'd do if I was invisible. He listened to it a few times and he's like, did he say rape? Did he say rape? He's like, no, he definitely said wreck. Hmm. Let's go with rape. It's like, I don't give much of a shit about wrecking, but I know if I was invisible. So there you go. The 10 best universal cl classic monster movies, according to Intermit. And God damn it. Let me start that over. Man, fuck. I'm having a hard time. Did they put your gallbladder in your brain instead? <laughs> they took my brain out through my stomach. The 10 best universal classic monster movies. According to Internet Movie Database. I'll go through those again. Number 10 was The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Number 9, The Mummy. Number 8, The Son of Frankenstein. Number 8, Dracula, the Spanish language version. Number 6, The Wolfman. Number 5, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Number 4, Dracula. Number 3, The Invisible Man. Number 2, Frankenstein. And number 1, The Bride of Frankenstein. Let me ask you this. Now, I'm not advocating for this, but it just seems odd that there hasn't been a true reboot or remake of Frankenstein. I know there's been like these little spinoffs like the shitty one with Aaron Eckhart in like the 2000s, but a true to self remake of Frankenstein. Don't you think that would have happened by now? It's been almost 100 years. Yeah, I think Universal was hoping to start that again. You know, they saw the success of the Marvel Universe and probably took a cue from Star Wars as well. And, and The they, Invisible Man did well. The Invisible Man did well. I, don't, I think that is... So they tried to start like a dark universe, you know, like a universal pictures, monsters, cinematic universe, like an Avengers of monsters. And they tried to start that with that movie, The Mummy, with Tom Cruise. But... Yeah, which sucked. I guess it really sucked. And then they abandoned those plans. So they may have had a plan for that then. But I did read that because of the success of the 2020 remake of The Invisible Man, Universal is looking at a reboot of The Wolfman starring Ryan Gosling. The Wolfman, they did have a, a Wolfman with... Benicio Del Toro. Yeah, and Anthony Hopkins was in it. It was bad. I was one of those, like, I started watching and about 10 minutes in, I said, I'm probably not going to finish this. Yeah. Yeah, I'd see a Frankenstein reimagining, but I don't want it to be some hunky Frankenstein like they always try to do now. Frankenstein's a monster I'm talking about. They always have a hunk play the Frankenstein. But just have a real Frankenstein movie. Just watch um, Young Frankenstein. It's on Amazon Prime right now. Okay. Well, that was a fun list. I knew it. I knew it would be. Well, it was fun because of me. I made it fun. Okay. I hope you and the listeners will discuss this episode on our subreddit. I'm going to give a quick plug here. I've mentioned it before, but I'm uh, really trying to help this new subreddit grow. It's run entirely by listeners, although I do contribute to comments on threads. It's a great place to discuss this and any other episode with other listeners. There's a weekly discussion thread for every episode. You can just go to reddit.com and search for Tennis Pod or the URL is reddit.com slash r slash tennis pod. Click the join button, and you can also hit the bell icon at the top to get alerts for new posts. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, and that Reddit is a real Frankenstein of an idea, you might say. Okay. Well, we're going to make like Abbott and Costello and meet the end of this episode. Episode 152 is next week, and it's the last episode of Spooktober. I have some interesting ideas, but I haven't landed on something yet. But it'll be there. Go land on something spooky. All right. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Thanks.
Bet with your friends on WinBet Sportsbook today using promo code BLUEWIRE to get up to $1,000 toward a risk-free sports bet. Sign up now at wynnbet.com. Offer subject to change terms and conditions at winbet.com. Must be 21 or older and present in the state where play-through WinBet is available. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700.